week we preached about King David, this incredible king who saw the greatest extension of God's kingdom on earth, the kingdom of the Israelites. It was called the golden era for the Israelites. An incredible time, and he's recognized by all and far that he was the greatest king the Israelites ever had. He had a heart after God. He saw a whole bunch of amazing things in his time and in his generation. But as you look at the story account in 1 Chronicles 13, 1 Chronicles 14, and 1 Chronicles 15, it's very clear the simple strategy this great king had. He inherited a kingdom in a mess. Uh, Saul had lost his way, he'd lost a heart after God, he'd lost the presence of God, he'd lost the word, and all that, there was a mess happening, and David comes in at king at that time, and you would think having warriors come around him, being known as the guy who slayed Goliath, he would run into battle and take back all the territories that were lost, but he didn't. And at the very start of a simple strategy to see the most successful era of that kingdom ever, he put a strategy in place, and this is a strategy. We're going to put the presence of God back in the middle of God's people. We're putting God in the center. We're taking God and the Ark of the Covenant, which hosted the presence of God at that time, and we're putting it right in the center, in the center of economics, in the center of politics, in the center of everything that God is about. We're putting God in the center. We're making God the center of it all again. And it's a simple strategy, and then he had other strategies. In 1 Chronicles 14, he faced his fears, he faced the enemy, and he inquired of God. Business people, you want to see breakthrough in a tough market environment, inquire of God. Ask him to lead you. Direct your steps. Make the decisions that he would show. And, and God keeps saying to you. But I want to speak about putting God in the center again today, because some people say, well, how do you do that? It's fine that David did that. How do you do that? Well, it's quite simple. One of the words that we've learned and we've understood when you read the Bible, there's this simple principle that discipline leads to delight. That if I discipline myself in areas like consistently go to gym over a long time, at the end of that, you're going to have a six pack. I want a six pack, by the way. That's like a thing. I told my kid, I'm going to be a fit belly. That was the promise I made him. I'm not there yet because I lack the discipline. It's a real thing. But if you, if you want to delight in areas, and I would say your marriage, if you want a marriage where there's much delight, there's some disciplines, like prioritizing time, and a couple of other things that are really important, like not hitting the button on find my iPhone, um, like, that are really important to have a delightful marriage, a del marriage in which we delight. There's some discipline that's required. Now, discipline's not a popular word in our world. It's has many other connotations and challenges attached to and yet the Bible says discipline is what a good father does for the sons and daughters he loves. He brings some discipline into their stories for their future. And as we navigate, I want you to repeat after me, and you're going to do it excited. Can you say, we? we. Okay, you're going to get more excited. It's Sunday. You guys slept a little bit longer than the other guys, so we, we. are, are. Fasting. fasting. Ah, caught you guys there. Ah, I got you there. Ah, you didn't see that one coming. We are fasting. And as a church, we're going to pursue God. We're going to put God in the center of all we do. And we're going to do it through a spiritual discipline the Bible presents called fasting, which many other religions and people uh, around the world know even better than most Christians. And yet Jesus says it's this incredible discipline that will lead to delight if you approach it in the white manner with the right understanding and I want to address some of that today because I think the challenge when you mention something like fasting, people, if you've been in church or not, depending on your age and your experience, you'll have a whole bunch of perspectives. So maybe some of these are your perspective, and I want to help you today present that so that we can run at this fast and we can take a hold of everything that God has for us. Because I want to see miracles. I want to see the kingdom of God advance in my age. I want to see salvations on the streets of the city. I don't care if the name life change is attached or not. I just want to see transformation that happens when Jesus encounters his people. That's what I want to see. I want to see miracles. You want to know a miracle? There's my mate there, his son-in-law. And I'm not saying this lightly, he should be dead. He got hit by a bus twice on his bicycle on Friday morning. Some of you might have even seen the big accident down at Dolphin Beach. That was his son-in-law. He didn't see the bus, it was his fault, but he got hit by a bus twice. He should be dead. And yet I'm standing next to him on Friday afternoon talking to him. Because his helmet's in half, his bike is in half, everything else is in half, but his body's whole. 
and he's a father of four kids who needs to be a, God is a God of miracles, God does that stuff, and you can say that's coincidence, you can say he angled his hit on the bus, right? Well, you should see the bus. It's a mess. But God is a God of miracles. I want to see more miracles. I want to see God's hand moving in areas. I've prayed for too many people on deathbeds with cancer. I'm saying, God, I need to see more of your kingdom break through in these areas. I'm trusting. I'm trusting for it. And one way we do that is we discipline ourselves for life, for breakthrough. So maybe you approach a fast with something of a, and excuse the language, I don't have better language, but, but I would call it a legalistic or religious understanding where I'm going to do this, it's going to be so hard, and the harder it is, the more God will pour out His favor, and as long as it's really, really hard, God might do something. No, that's not what we're doing here, and I want to help you. They might be on the other side of that scale, something of a, well, God's done it anyway, his grace is perfect. Why would I fast? And, and why, would, why would God need a discipline? You know, it's very much in the Bible. It's very much in the New Testament. And Jesus very much shows and displays for us the benefits of some discipline called fasting in our lives. And so we partner with God. Maybe you've got an overrealized understanding of sever- sovereignty of God. Well, what difference will it make if I do anything anyway? What will it matter if I pray for someone in Uzbekistan? What will it matter I would say you have a lack of understanding of how God works and he wants to partner with his people. And the grace of God is at work when we pursue partnership with the living God to see the kingdom of God come. Otherwise, the gospel wasn't necessary. Otherwise, he could have come and in a flick of his fingers, he could have turned the story. But he said, I want to a people who will pursue me, who will trust me, who will partner with me in the great gospel. What about some statements like, well, been there, done that. I fasted in the 80s. You know, that was my time. I saw miracles. We did it really hard. We fasted on water alone for a long time. Like, well, I love telling stories of the 80s, and I love telling stories of the 90s and the 2000s and the teens or tens or whatever those things were called. They're gone now. We're in 2020. I want to tell stories of my generation. I want to tell stories of the dead being raised in my generation. Oh, Mark, that's radical. Yes, it is radical. It's called the gospel. It's called Jesus. It's called His word. I want to see that. I've seen miracles. I've seen too many miracles to say God isn't a miracle worker. And lastly, maybe that is your statement. Well, Mark, that's just too radical. Three weeks, don't worry, not water for three weeks. I will clarify. Some of you are like, I'm going to get that six pack. It's not the agenda, and we are not doing water. We are calling us to a Daniel fast, but, but it's too radical. Now, one of the reasons we're doing our first 21-day fast is for 21 years, God has been radically faithful to this community. For 21 years, God has radically saved. For 21 years, God has radically healed. For re- 21 years, God has radically reformed and stories and poured His grace upon this community, and we're going to pursue Him because He's been faithful because He says greater things are yet to come, and I want those. I want what the world won't understand. They're not going to understand fasting. I'm okay if they don't understand fasting as long as they understand that God is a mighty king who moves his hand in power. I love the fact that many of my friends have known me for many years, and when something goes down, they phone me. They ask me to pray because they've known that I've trusted God for a long time, and I want the same for your story because people will be looking for a God one day who can move in power to restore, heal, raise the dead, but three simple encouragements this morning. Maybe, and maybe some of you are like, Mark, you don't need to encourage me of fasting. I'm on this thing. Awesome. But most people aren't. And I know that by the conversations I've had this week. By people like, yo, bro, that's radical. Like, no, just relax. You will be okay. It's just vegetables. What? No. <laughs> Number one, a physical action. Fasting is a physical action that releases heavenly results. So uh, simple. How does fasting really move? What difference does it make if I'm eating chicken or vegetable, Mark? That's not the issue. The issue is the discipline. And there's this story that plays out in Exodus 17, and it starts like this. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. He stands on the top of the mountain. And while his hands are lifted, Joshua and the warriors of God have victory. But the minute his hands start to drop, they start losing. And then they lift his hands up. And while his hands are lifted, they have victory. 
But should his hands start to drop and ultimately they have victory because his hands are up. What does his hands being up have to do with victory on a battlefield? I don't know. I just know there was faith. I just know God spoke to a leader who'd walked with him for, gener- for, for all his life and seen miracle after miracle. And at that time, God spoke to this leader and said, I need you to have your hands raised. What does fasting do and change in our city, in the economics and, and the politics? I don't know. I just know my hands have to be raised. My prayers need to be raised. And God's calling me to trust him. And they saw a miracle that day because a physical act of obedience brought the favor of God to the people of God. I want the favor of God for you. I want the favor of God for me. I'm going to speak about that in a little bit, but I will also say that there's an obedience factor to this. Moses understood something. He understood that God was faithful. The same guy that God brought water from a rock for. The same guy that led God's people out of, out of brokenness and chains. He understood the dynamics of God and what it meant to walk with God. Oh, Mark, that's an Old Testament reality. Well, why does Jesus challenge us and call us to fast because sometimes physical acts bring heavenly results and and I remember the day I was leading a meeting in Durban I led one meeting we had a gap and then we had another meeting and a man walked down the middle of the auditorium and um, this man had had a challenged life he'd been deaf his whole life and was completely dependent on diabetes medication on insulin had the bag with but he had had an, a, a, an insulin, no, a diabetic attack. I'm not quite sure how you say that, so I'm going to say that. That had landed him in hospital. He'd been in hospital for about two weeks. And while in hospital, he felt God say, I need you to go to that church on top of the Durban station. I want to do something with your life. Please understand, I didn't wake up that morning thinking, I'm going to pray for someone who's deaf today. That wasn't in me. What was in me was, I know God. I love God, I pursue God, but that wasn't in me. What was in a man was, I'm going to do a physical act. I'm going to get out of this hospital bed, and instead of go to a restaurant and treat myself, I'm going to go to a church, and I'm going to ask someone to pray for me, because I believe God wants to do something in my life. And with faith, he did a physical act that landed him at a church, that we prayed with a group of people, and his hearing came back for the first time in his life. Didn't come back. He'd never heard. And I was that guy. I'm more shocked than anyone. I'm like behind him. Just check if you've been around church a while. You've seen some of that stuff. Just Sure, God, I'm more surprised than him. And then then I found out later, actually, he didn't even realize at the time either his diabetes had been healed. And I got papers from doctors two weeks later saying diabetes healed, hearing back perfectly. And God is a God of miracles. I've seen too many things to not believe it, to not trust it. And sometimes if God asks me to discipline my life for a season, for a time, for a couple of weeks, to see more of that, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. And Jesus, amazingly, he fasted. And understand this, it was the first act in Matthew chapter 3, straight after the Spirit of God speaks and the Father speaks from heaven and said, this is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. How does Jesus respond to that? He says, actually, I'm going to discipline myself. This is not a father looking to see if his kids can do it. This is a father wanting to thrust his kids forward into the more. You want to speed up in the things of God in your life? Well, learn to break sometimes. Ask a racing car driver. The number one trick they need to know is how to break properly so they can speed up into the next corner. You speed into every corner, you hit the wall. But if you learn how to use your brakes, the right time to slow down, to pull yourself out of the mess, the noise, and the speed. When you hit the straights, you can go. And I want that for us. It's our 21st year. Maybe it sounds a little naive. Maybe it sounds a little bit like Mark's very excited. I am. When I turned 21, it was an exciting time of life. An exciting time of life. I finished my studies. I started working for an amazing company. I always work. Uh, but the best thing of all, I met an incredible girl named Candace Enslin, who I fell in love with. And life started to speed up. Things started to speed up. It was an exciting time of life. For us as a church, this is an exciting time. And the second thing I want to say about Jesus and his fasting is he presents it this way, and maybe this can help shape some of your understanding, and I want to speak about what happens when we fast from favor and for favor. Relax, I'm going to explain what I mean. Matthew 6, Jesus speaking, when you fast, say when, when you fast, not if, not if you feel like it, when you fast, he's speaking to the believers, says 
Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their, full in, their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. Yes, why not? And um, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's an incredibly misunderstood concept of what is the difference between being favored of God, receiving rewards, and being loved by God. So let me clarify for you, the love of God is perfectly in God. You can do nothing to affect it. Zero. You cannot diminish his love by 0.1% by anything you do because he is perfect love. But the favor of God is something we get given when we get saved. But to grow and increase in the favor of God and to see more and more of his kingdom, he calls for some things of us. He calls us to understand our sonship, to grow in our obedience, and to pursue him. One of the ways we do that is by disciplining ourselves. It's actually the greatest discipline you can learn. How do you self-discipline? How do you, rather than a child needs to be told, do this, do this, do this, the next day, do this, do this, do this. As adults, we grow up, some of those things become intuitive because we've allowed that discipline to come upon our lives. So I want to say this, we fast from favor because we are given favor, but also for more favor. The favor of God is an incredible thing. This statement, if I have found favor in your eyes, that exact statement is mentioned 53 times in the Bible. From um, Abraham through to Hannah, through to David, when he ran from Absalom, he cries out to God, if I have found favor in your eyes. That word favor in ancient Israel was always expressed because they didn't have that exact word. They would express it this way, through your face. I'm going to try to help you understand that. It's a little bit weird. Through your face. Well, one of the ways I can help you explain it is through Aaron's prayer of blessing in Numbers chapter 6. This is how it reads, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you twice, toward you and give you peace. That word and be gracious, that word and gracious means to grant favor. So Lord, this prayer of blessing is, would the Lord turn his face towards you and grant his favor to you? Because his favor is found in his face as we look into the face of God. It's an incredible understanding because the word gracious means to grant favor. It pulls us into the story and it's found in God's face. You see, I want more. I, I want to trust God for more, but through scripture we start to understand that to be favored is not perfectly related. It's because of the love of God that we find favor with God. But to grow in favor, to grow in favor of God upon our lives, we pursue that. It's obedience. It's pursuing God. It's trusting Him. This is not some legalistic work. This is the privilege of sonship. God wants us close. He, he wants us intimate. He wants us in that place of favor. Uh, uh, and lastly, I want to present this thought that in fasting, we become desirable to God. Uh, this is probably the best part for me. See, guys, when you take a legalistic religious understanding into something like fasting, you actually lose the whole thing. But when I fast, I become desirable to God. I, I've got three little boys, and I get up really early on a Sunday, and they get on with life. But one just decided to sleep in, and I desired to be close to him. So I went upstairs, and while he's in his little bed, I snuggled in there, and I, I desired to hold him because I desire him. I desire intimacy with him. I, I love him. And, and he kind of wakes up, checks at me, closes his eye again, goes back to sleep. Doesn't matter that, that he's not a snuggler and I am. He just knows it's me and this is what I desire. Okay, some of you think he's a snuggler. Don't worry. We don't have to hug. But this Daniel fast is not just a fast because he did it, it's a fast because of his life. This man, Daniel, was in exile. He was in a foreign nation from a young age, and he served four different kings. And under each of those kings, he would find incredible favor to the point that he was influencing a nation. Then the next king would come, and because he was in exile, he'd come down again, and that king would promote him again. Why? Because the obvious and clear hand of God and favor of God was upon his life. 
And to such a point that this exile in a foreign land got an unbelieving king to sing a song of praise to the almighty God. That's the end game. I want kings to sing about Jesus because of my life, not because of my life, but because of Jesus's. And this man in exile for all these years, 67 years in exile, even longer, because of his life, because of the disciplines in his life. Firstly, we encounter this man's life, and it says there, there came a time where the, the satraps and all the lanies of the day didn't like the fact this exile had authority in the land. No one really likes that. It. You see it around the world. Foreigners getting, no one likes this. So the governments try to put things in place, and they try to do that. And so they said to him, you can't pray and worship your gods. And he said, this is how the Bible said, Daniel went home three times a day and prayed as he had always done. He wasn't making a petulant statement to a king. He was just doing what he'd done every day because that was his discipline. His spiritual discipline that led to spiritual delight in the knowledge of God that led to favor upon his life. There's another spiritual discipline we see in his life. In Daniel chapter 1, he's 16 years old. He's a young man in a foreign nation, probably with his natural, natural inclinations, wanting to please this new king. He says, no, but I love God. I've always loved God. And if this gets me in trouble, it gets me in trouble. But I'm not going to defile myself by eating the foods of this nation. I'm going to fast. And he takes on a spiritual discipline at a young age. And then in Daniel chapter 10, we see him fast again under King Cyrus. He, he seemed to have this pattern of fasting where he, he would put aside the desirable foods of the day. And I want to just open up that scripture a little bit because I think it's incredible. In Daniel chapter 10, which once you go past Daniel chapter 6 gets tricky to navigate. But he's praying and he's weeping and he's mourning because he's had a prophetic inclination as a prophet that there's war coming and there's trial coming. And he puts it this way. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. I want to carry on with the story a little bit. He encounters this angel, and this angel approached him. Actually, let me read it, verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphrates around his waist. Waist. <laughs> His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. The reason I say that is it starts out this in those days, Daniel was mourning. He says, I ate no delicacies. If you go look at the roots of that word, he's saying, I ate no desirable foods. It means he, he still ate food, but he didn't eat desirable foods. He put aside meat. He put aside delicacies. He put aside extras, sugars, and probably the cappuccino of his day. He put that all aside. He said he's going to survive on vegetables. Remember, he lived in royal lands. He had access to the best food. He said, I'm going to put all those desirable things that are desirable for me aside for a time because I'm pursuing God. I want to put God at the center. I want to jump ahead to verse 11, because this is where it's amazing. This angel encounters him and reveals something of God to him, places his hand on his shoulder and said, and he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved. The translation of that is man greatly desired. It says you're greatly loved, that's the translation, but the root word of that is man greatly desired. So it starts off by a man and his action of placing aside desired food. And it, God speaks through his angel at that time to Daniel and says, You are a man I greatly desire. I don't know what you want from your Christianity. Christianity. I don't know what you think the end game of the journey is. 
To me, the gospel is simple. Jesus came to make a way to the Father, to show me a Father, and to lead me to the Father so I could be in relationship with the Father. I want to be desired by my Father. And when I look at this man, Daniel's life, and the fruitfulness and faithfulness of God and favor upon his life, but then I understand why. Because he placed aside desirable things for a time, in a tough time. And the result was he became desired by God. I want that for us as a church. I want that for my life. I want that for your life. And I want to say that when it doesn't make sense to the world, it's okay. That's called being a disciple of Jesus. It's not going to make sense to everyone. When it doesn't make sense sometimes to ourselves, that's okay. As long as we are doing it in faith, understanding that on the other side there is a father who longs and desires intimacy with his people, and he's looking for us to place God at the center of all things. Yes, your business. Yes, your family. Yes, every area of your life. That's called Christianity. And sometimes we water it down to, I feel good. So because I feel good, I feel like I worship God. I don't have to lift my hands. No, lift your hands in statement to yourself. Uh, 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 God can touch me over there. Yes, he can. But sometimes it takes a crawling through a crowd like a lady with an issue of blood who crawled through a crowd to just touch Jesus. Did he have to have her crawl? No, he could have healed her 30 meters away. But he's looking for faith. He's looking for a people who will desire him, placing other desirable things aside. So we position ourselves as desired of God. I want to be that. I don't want to be a lot more than that, to be brutally honest. Because with that comes the favor of God. With that comes his grace and his good. His love is a given. Don't question that. But there's a growing in measures of his favor upon my life that I want. That when I'm walking into rooms where there are bodies that are dead and dying, I want to know that the favor of God is with me and I've pursued God with every area so I can speak life to dead bodies and they will be set free. And one last scripture. Jesus' disciple encounter a young boy struggling with demons and sickness, and, and the, the disciples try to cast out the demon, but they can't do it. You know the scripture? And um, Jesus answers, Oh, faithful, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples, that happened a lot to Jesus, by the way. He did that a lot. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, these men he loved, who he trained, he has invested, he says, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible. But this kind, the, this kind never comes out except with prayer and fasting. It, it just never comes out except with prayer and fasting. I want the kinds. I want to see victory in the kinds that come out with free and fasting. I want to see demons leave. I want to see chains broken. I want to see the dead who, or, or who where the pulse is very small get off those tables, full and strong, and God gets all the glory. I want to see miracles. And this is not a personal little, this is, should be the endeavor of every Christian. And Jesus says, well, guys, here's the reason you lack faith. There's unbelief. See, unbelief comes when we get disconnected from God. I promise you, stand in the presence of God, you won't lack faith. Move away from the presence of God, you will lack faith. The enemy will start to speak. You'll be reminded that you're in a world of chaos. But stay close and connected to God, and you're in faith. And he says, actually, when you're not connected to God, there's another issue. You're a twisted generation. You become connected to other things. So maybe this fast is us positioning and posturing ourselves to see the full measures of God's favor in our lives and to say, God, we're going to disconnect from other things so that we connect with you. What we are calling the church to is a three-week Daniel fast. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what that is. It's all over the internet. It's very clear. It's in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 10. But essentially, it's vegetables and water, which for some of you is going to be easier. For some of us who like things like little beans that become coffee, it's challenging. Or meat, because I'm not a vegetarian, if I'm being brutally honest. I like those things. I desire those things. But you know what I desire more? To be desired by God. That where I am, and because I am there, not because I'm a preacher, 
not because I'm anything special, but because I'm loved by God and desired by God. When I pray prayers of faith to move mountains, God will move mountains of cancer yeah. and other areas of brokenness. I, I want to be positioned for that. It's still in his hands. It's still his thing, but I want to be positioned for that. And this is not some re legalistic positioning. This is about saying, God, I want the everything that you have for me. So two quick tips on how to do this. Number one, prepare well. I'm an adventurer, so it means I've got to prepare well because I'm taking sometimes very small little boys in areas where I might have to feed them on the other side. So I prepare. I take water. I take food when we go on an adventure. We're going on an adventure, three weeks of fasting. Prepare. Do some research. Understand that actually this will be good for your body. It will get rid of toxins and a whole bunch of things. But that's not why we're doing it. But you do need to prepare. You can't just stop eating everything you eat and decide, I don't like vegetables, so you just stop eating. That won't work. You've got to prepare yourself spiritually, physically, and I would say prepare your calendar. We're taking a hold of the living God, which means if you need to cancel one or two dinner dates, cancel them. Postpone them. If you need to cancel one or two meetings, do that. Make space in your diary. Maybe it's two or three times a day. Take five minutes out, and instead of going for a coffee, walk a pavement and pray to the living God. Pray for your colleagues. Pray for your work colleagues. Pray for their salvation. Pray for healing. And secondly, I would say write down your goal as you enter this time. Write down why you have faith. I've told the story before, but I've written some letters to myself at key times of my life, not because I'm schizophrenic, but because sometimes when I'm lacking faith, I forget the words of faith God spoke. Write down at the start of this time, say, what are you trusting for? And please make sure that at least half of the things on that list aren't for yourself. They're for the city. They're for salvation. But as we go into this, we're going to go in faith. Won't you stand with me? My last encouragement is to parents. Take your kids on this faith journey. What does that mean? I'm not saying if your kids are anything like mine, the idea of eating vegetables alone for three weeks alone will kill them. But with wisdom, take them on the journey. When my kids know fasts are coming, they know that as a family, we have a discipline that leads to life. We're trusting for things. See, I've taken them on the journey of, I was at a hospital yesterday and I prayed for someone and they passed away and I'm doing their funeral this week. I'll take them on that journey. But if I only take them on that journey and I don't take them on the journey of we're going to trust God, we're going to hold on to God. If I don't teach them how to pray, See, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. They didn't ask him, how do we do miracles? They said, how do I pray? Our Father, he taught them that. Take your kids on a faith journey at this time. It's going to be a little harder. It might look like no TV or screen time and some tougher things as parents, but I promise you, your kids one day will turn around and go. My parents were people of faith. who trust in Almighty God and when the world's shouting at me, don't believe, don't have faith. They remember that their parents. I believe Karen Feltz is alive today because of the prayer of praying parents. You can, I can't prove it. I'm just telling you. God honors the prayers of his people. He, he's faithful. Take them on a journey. Can we close our eyes for a second? I realize I've spoken long today. But God, before I can even pray for this community, I pray for myself. I want to put you at the center. As a community, we say, God, we aren't just doing some religious act that looks special. We have an earnest desire to put you at the center of all that we do. Planting a church without you at the center is fruitless and pointless. But with you at the center, all things are possible. Of our lives, be at the center. Of our marriages, be the center. Of our Focus and attention be the center at this time, God. We look forward to the testimonies, the miracles, the wonders that you will do. And we stand on the precipice of this fast eight days away. We say, God, have your way. Move us from apathy into action. Move us to seek and to trust you again where we've trusted in the past and maybe lost faith to trust again. Get us to that place again. But most of all, God, the greatest desire of my life is to be desired by my Father in heaven. I want to be desired by you, God. 
where things get in the way, I pray, allow us to disconnect from those things so we can connect to you again. Have all the glory, all the honor. I pray for every person here, your blessing, your favor. I pray for those that this might be the first fast or every, any spiritual discipline or act. I pray courage. I pray strength. I pray wisdom. But lead us, Spirit of God, and have all the, all the glory, all the honor. Mighty King.